welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we are going to be speaking with Helene Neville, who is a grandmother, a four-time cancer survivor, a nurse, and she has also run the perimeter of the continental United States to inspire health and unity. Helene, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for inviting me on your wonderful show. Oh, you're welcome. Can you just tell our audiences where you where you're based at the moment? I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Fantastic. And, <laughs> and what's that like living over there? Crazy. Um, <laughs> I love it. The the people outside. You know, once you're outside the strip, it's it's just like a community in every city, every state. So it's it's really nice. This has just sort of blown my mind sort of hearing your story. You know, you ran the perimeter of the continental United States. That's 9,715 miles. Can you sort of tell our listeners sort of how this came about? Absolutely. Um, in 2010, I, you know, I had been working as a nurse since 1984. And I was approaching age 50 and thought, you know, what more could I do? I survived cancer, three brain surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, and, and I just kept going. And I thought, why don't I just sit down and inspire nurses, write my first book, Nurses in Shape, which is a kind of a fitness wellness book, to try to get nurses to become better ambassadors for health and then inspire that back into their community or their patients. So I wrote the book and thought, how could I get this message out to the millions of people? I came up with this idea. What if I just take the book and run with it, literally, on foot? In 2010, that's what I did. And I trained for about a year. I didn't know how I was going to do it, what was needed. I just knew why I was doing it. And that propelled me to get going. And all I saw were thousands of miles of the U.S. to cross and conquer. Because let's just let's just go back a bit a bit more to what you said. So, you were t- you were coming up to fifty years of age. You'd already had you know three brain surgeries, and you kept on going. What what kept you going? Well, in nineteen ninety eight, I was told to you know my immune system wasn't going to work properly, and basically go home and wait around to probably die. And to me. I just thought, you know, if that was true, what more could I do? I wanted to leave a big imprint, and my sons were quite young, 11 and 13, and I just wanted to start creating positive memories every single day. So rather than sit home and wait, I literally left the hospital that day and went home and signed up for the Chicago Marathon. (laughs) And how how did that go? I ran six times. My longest run was six miles. And I thought, wow, maybe I overtrained. I ran that marathon. It was 77 days later from when the doctors said to, you know, go home and basically give up. And I ran it in four hours and 28 minutes. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. That's fantastic. So you, you obviously, you know, you had your two sons and you wanted to create these positive memories. Why did you choose running? Was, you, was that something that you'd or, always done or you'd been interested in? Well, I ran in high school, a little bit in college. I was pretty good, but, you know, that was the 800 meters. I had never run probably longer than maybe 10 or 15 miles. I had no idea how long a marathon was. And to kind of measure that out, I packed my sons in the car and we drove 26 miles. And I thought, well, that's not too bad. And maybe it's the point two that gets people. But I just knew I wanted to do it. It was close. I was living in Iowa and the Chicago Marathon was the closest marathon to Iowa. And I just wanted to do it. Good for you. And it's not just Chicago as well. You've run marathons sort of all over the, all yes. over America. Yes, including, including London, which actually was my favorite because of the fans. It was so unbelievable. London has an incredible atmosphere. Actually, all the way along, it's just constant cheering. Do you have a favorite part of the London Marathon? I think the Tower Bridge was fun, and we ran by Big Ben. Just You know, it was flat and pretty much asphalt the whole way, and it was just, I think there were 40,000 people, and 
it was wonderful. Like you said, the atmosphere, it was just the camaraderie, the people cheering you on. That's what helped me. No, absolutely. I've, I've run London five times myself. And the yeah. two points that you um, that you mentioned are absolutely my favourite. Coming into Tower Bridge, it just sort of blows my mind. For the first yeah. bit, it blows my mind. And then as soon as you cross over the bridge, um, you can see the other runners who are already, they've already run like 14 miles ahead of you and they're running back yeah. down the other way. So that's a little bit depressing. But then coming up to Big Ben as well, you just know the the final 250 meters is coming up and that you're going to make it you are going to get to the very end so you've obviously had had this background in running and you decide to write this book so nurses in shape when you were working as a nurse were you still in shape or were were you struggling to balance having a full-time job looking after your children and also you know doing fitness and exercise no I was always in shape and I'm I'm kind of a small person small frame I was always in shape, and I just really wanted to inspire other nurses. We're on the front lines. Who better to inspire the health of the nation than nurses? We're just perfectly positioned, but yet nurses, I just felt, really aren't that those great ambassadors of health to, to inspire that health in patients. You have to look and feel the part, really, to be able to teach your patients what to do. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I I have sort of certain unwritten rules. For example, if I'm listening to anybody um, who's, give, who's someone who's trying to give me advice about, say, health or fitness, and I look at them and I think, well, actually, I, I, I can't take advice from you just because I don't believe, you know, I look at them as an, as an example. I just, uh, well, so what I was going to say is um, I've had people who've come up to me before and said, oh, you know, I'd love to be your, your personal trainer. I'd love to help you out. And I've looked at them. I just thought, I don't I don't want to look like you. That's you're not inspiring me. And the same yeah. goes, you know, for nurses. If you've got nurses telling you, you know, eat your, uh, eat your five fruit and veg a day and, you know, be healthy and do exercise. And then you're looking at them and thinking you're not taking your own advice here. So I do agree that, you know, th- they are on the front line. And America obviously has a massive problem with obesity, as does the UK in many Western countries at the moment. So, so you're trying to drive this, this health in- initiative and, and drive this awareness. What else does your book contain? Is it mainly about diet and nutrition? or Everything, sleeping, buying the proper bed, motivation. And, but, you know, a couple hundred miles into that first run in 2010, it just became so much bigger than that. I, started, I stopped at hospitals, cancer centers, elementary schools, high schools along the way. And I realized that it's everybody that needs inspiration. And and that's what it kind of blossomed into really inspiring the country as a whole. Oh, that's fantastic. Talk us through this this challenge. Obviously, you wanted to take your book and you wanted to run with it and you're going to take it around the continental U.S. Where did you start from and how did you break your journey down? The first year we had an our old dilapidated RV and recruited people to come in, fly in at certain locations, and then fly, drive for 10 days with me, fly out. And literally, they would drop me on the highway. I started in Ocean Beach, California, and then just ran east on Interstate 10, stopping after each day's run, I would stop at hospitals and things. But the RV would just drop me and I would run 25, 30 miles to hopefully wherever they set up camp, which I hoped was 25 or 30 miles. But along the southern portion of the U.S., it's so desolate in all of New Mexico, West Texas, found out along the run, RV parks are much further apart than 25 miles. So I, I just ran until the next location where there was an RV park housing and it worked. It seemed to work, although there were some tough days and lots of obstacles. But I ran in the summer. I started May 1st. And of all the runners that have crossed America on foot along the southern route, only six prior to me had ever run across that route. And all were men and all did it in the winter. So, of course, I thought, well, I'm going to take it on in the summer. <laughs> and so I was the first person that ever crossed the U.S., along the south in the summer and it was hot <laughs> I can imagine it you, you mentioned about the tough days what were the, what were the toughest days what made them so tough just being out there all alone on the highways of America 
with literally, I mean, imagine running 25 miles or more every single day, all alone with everything you need to survive for that day on your back. And, and it's just, it was grueling. It was just grueling. And each day presented its own issues, whether it was, you know, the terrain or the, the climate, of course, the weather, it was one day my, the sole of my shoe melted off. It was so hot, but you just keep going. You keep finding a way to get over that mountain, under it, through it. Somehow you have to keep going and staying out there was, is the toughest part. Hugely challenging, both physically and mentally. So in, in terms of the, the mental side of things, how did you keep yourself going? What, were, what sort of things were you saying to yourself? Well, you get into this zone and, you know, I wasn't very good to run with other people because people are fresh and they fresh legs, they're, they're well rested. And here I'm doing it over and over again every single day. And they want to chit chat and talk, but I'm in that zone and you just can't break that zone. I was just out there for the bigger picture, what my mission was, which was, you know, there's always somebody in the next town down in the next state that maybe needs a little bit of inspiration, that little spark. And and I just knew at that particular time in my life that I was that spark and I kept going just to find more people that all just to say hello or hold their hand or give them a pat to keep going themselves. I'm actually training for an event myself called the Marathon des Sables, which is six marathons. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Oh, awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Six marathons and six days across the Sahara Desert. So I was going to ask you, um, how did you cope with the heat? So obviously you mentioned, you know, six, um, six guys had done it before all through winter and you've so far have been the only woman to take this, this, you know, run the Southern U S during the summer. It's incredibly hot down there when you're crossing through sort of places like Texas. How did you cope with that heat? Well, I thought I was uniquely qualified because nursing, you know, we have that knowledge of intake versus output. So I had that covered (laughs) and then nursing is, the career path is about giving and never giving up. So I thought I'm qualified for this, but I love the heat. I trained in Arizona, which is dry heat, not much humidity. And it was tough as once I hit Texas where the humidity was pretty, um, pretty hard and harsh. I just kept going and, um, just, it's a lot of, um, balancing your fluids. Were you taking salt tablets as well? Uh, Just just occasionally when it, probably not until I hit Louisiana, Florida. You know, I think I I really try to get everything I need in nutrition with the foods I eat. I, I try to get all the vitamins and minerals and I don't really take supplements at all. So how would you describe a typical day? Typical day was just dropped off where I finished the day before and I was left out there and I would just go and 25 miles or more with the sun beating down. You know, I I did cover up from sun exposure. I wore gloves, uh, compression gloves. I told people for swelling, but it was really to protect my manicure out there. (laughs) And uh, I covered up with a long sleeve shirt, a hat that kind of draped down like a veil and smeared white zinc oxide on my face and of course red lipstick so I looked kind of ridiculous it's there was nothing sexy about my outfit but I looked kind of like the joker from Batman who looked like maybe he was going to do some gardening (laughs) (laughs) so you carried on this run and um, I've spoken to people before who've done like, like these incredible running challenges and they're always you know they're sort of exhausted at the end of the day and sort of they're they're physically drained but you were stopping off and giving talks whether it was in schools or or hospitals or for charities how did you have the energy to do that somehow I harnessed that energy and because it was the greater mission and really those drivers that would fly in and kind of support me they just couldn't believe it they were tired just watching me they they just didn't get it but I think when you're in that zone and you're on that adrenaline high, you just keep going. And I even finished running, showered, and usually put on a dress and then showed up at the speeches at hospitals or schools. And I just loved it. It, it gave, it actually gave me more, 
I think it empowered me more to keep going just by the response of the community. And how many days did it take you to, to get over to Florida? It took 93 days. It was 2,520 miles. Wow. And, and what would you say was the, was the highlight of the trip, of your, the first part of your trip? Well, each day was just wonderful, but there were some good memories. Um, I did run with a few people. The highlight might have been the finish line. People had heard about me. A lot of there, there wasn't a lot of interest in from people to run with me because runners, as you know, typically like sixty degrees. I'm running; it's one hundred and seventeen, so nobody really wanted to come out and run. But the finish line, they had promoted it so much that almost two hundred people showed up for the last day to run with me and escort me to the finish line, and they were made up of cancer survivors, nurses, runners, just. Lots of people, even two two nuns, showed up in their habits. <laughs> oh, fantastic! That must have meant a huge, a huge amount to you. The fact that you are actually having this impact and you're connecting with people from from what you're doing. I still hear from the people from the first run, just how much their life had changed since meeting me, and things that they thought were impossible. They they rethink that, and uh, you know they try. Now they just let's let's try this challenge let's just see what imagine the possibilities if you just put action behind it absolutely i think it's so important if people if people can see other people doing it it can give them that sense of belief because you think well if she can do it i can do it and it's really important to get those role models out there i'm i'm really um passionate about showing other women and other girls whether who listen to this podcast that there are women out there who've done these extraordinary challenges and that you know they're ordinary women doing this so I take it you broke the race down into four parts then so you started off in California ran to Florida Florida up to the um, past New York where would that take you to after the 2010 run I knew I wanted to keep going because the journey never ends and I'm so glad you mentioned about people seeing you out there and they get inspired and that's exactly why I was out there and stayed out there because if they knew the story and then found out, wow, she's been through all of these things and look at what she is doing and therefore what are the possibilities for me? So that's exactly why I stayed out there. And, and I'm so glad you just mentioned it. But after that 2010 run, I had full intention to keep going, but it was put on hold because I was diagnosed with T-cell lymphoma in late 2011. But that didn't stop me from 2013. I went to Vancouver, Canada, and I ran from Vancouver, Canada, Tijuana, Mexico. It was 1,560 miles, and I did it in 45 days with an average of 37 miles in a day. Wow. <laughs> but in addition to that, right before that run, and I had just finished chemo a couple months prior my 56-year-old brother passed away. He was a fabulous guitar player. And I carried his urn filled with his ashes, which was about 26 pounds, in my backpack, and he ran with me. Oh, that's lovely. When did you, were you taken into a special place? I couldn't decide what to do. <laughs> so I did take him into every, every guitar shop or music store I passed along the way from Canada to Mexico. I stopped in, in his honor. And I... You know, I took photos of his urn at the Hollywood sign, different places, but he continued to travel with me and the whole rest of the journey. After that, 2014, I started in Marathon, Florida. 68 days and almost 2,000 miles later, I finished in Portland, Maine. And then 2015, May 1st, I started in St. Stephen's, New Brunswick, Canada, and ran all the way through 3,700 miles and. 128 days to Ocean Shores, Canada, or Ocean Shores, Washington. I just want to ask you a bit more, you know, you being diagnosed um, with cancer four times before, um, and then you got diagnosed with um, T-cell lymphoma. What goes through your mind when that happens? Just to keep going. There's, there's always somebody worse off. And, uh, you know, as long as there's breath in you, you can still be an example for somebody, either a caregiver, 
helping a loved one through the battle with cancer or a nurse or, or the cancer patient themselves. And I just stayed out there just to hopefully inspire them. And that, that kept me going. I don't sit and think what if, or if my time's limited, you know, I, I try to, I don't save the best for last because in my case and really in everybody's case, we never know when last will be. So every moment of every day should be our best. Very, very wise words there. You know, you're, you're out there. How many people do you think you've connected with? You know, do you know how many talks that you've given or how many people have attended those talks? Oh, lots, thousands, uh, over I, probably 200 places I stopped, the businesses, hospitals, cancer centers, military bases, schools. And I'm continu- I continue to stop and give speeches or travel. You know, a lot of those places have asked me to come back, and, and I've been quite busy with that. But lots of people, there's 5,000 plus on the Facebook page, one on the run, but those people hopefully have gone on to inspire others. So uh, we don't know the number. You just never know how many people I touch that just passed it forward. Absolutely. So if there are people listening who may have received some bad news, whether it's to do with their health or to do with their career or to do their job, what advice would you give them in, in terms of how to deal with it? Are there any steps that you that you take or any processes that you go through that you could um, could advise on? Well, it's not one size fits all. It just depends on the person. However, you just don't know who's watching you. And, and I just try to be a good example or lead by example of how to fight through devastating news. And, you know, there's so much more cancer, which is really concerning. It's younger and younger. And and, and I just want to find a way to, to, to beat it. And hopefully, maybe all of us, this spark will become this large wave that we can fight this together as one big community worldwide and figure out what's causing it and how to stop it and, and how to pay for it. And people, unfortunately, I met so many women in particular that why should a diagnosis of cancer why do you have to lose your home, your job, sometimes your family? It's just not right. And it's you know, we have to pull together and help each other through it. I try to tell people, if you know somebody with cancer, go drop off a grocery card for or a gas card at their door. Don't wait for them to reach out to you. You reach out to them. Plant a little flower by their window. Whatever it is, the littlest things make, and that's what, people did for me and and that made all the difference and kept me going I think sometimes people most probably find it very difficult to um they don't know what to say or don't know how to act and so instead of almost facing that fear they just either ignore it or or just don't know how to approach the situation you mentioned that you're a health activist what does that involve well just that I I try to inspire health for me what worked for me you know, in 98, I took on Chicago Marathon. Then I entered a couple bodybuilding competitions. Everything they told me I couldn't do, I tried. I I climbed mountains and, and I just kept running from cancer. I had a lot of setbacks, but I kept going. And But the thing that really helped me, I believe, when I took on bodybuilding, I learned so much more about nutrition and detoxing my body. And And I think that's why I'm so successful with running and why I'm still alive. I I literally, everything in my body was plant-based or sometimes protein source when I'm out there was in the form of animal protein because of I had to recover in within 20 hours to get back out there or within 12. So what worked for me was the nutrition part. So you mentioned about detoxing the body. What advice, can you expand on that a bit more? I, I teach juicing classes and I really truly believe in it. It's all about plants and, you know, the kale, all the dark greens, which, which has all the minerals, vitamins, everything we need. And I, I, think it, I think it worked and it helped for me. What would be your top three health tips for our listeners? If it was made in a plant, don't eat it. If it comes from a plant, absolutely eat it. I like that. <laughs> and, and 
you know, people say motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing, and that's why we recommend it daily. <laughs> and I, what I tell kids and what I tell nurses and just the general public is we're the only one, me, you, qualified to be you and just be your best you that you can be. And every day you might have to rethink impossible, which is kind of my tagline whether it's getting off the couch or changing one thing in your diet or, you know, you fail a test, will you come right back stronger because you're the only one that can do it. So what is next for you then? What's going to be your next challenge? Well, I actually go to the Mayo Clinic this coming week in uh, Minnesota and just to get a checkup, make sure everything's going well. I'd like to run 150 consecutive miles on the Las Vegas Strip, back and forth about 27 times. And I picked 150 because there's a project here, one Project 150, which feeds homeless high school students. And I'm going to try to raise money for that. And so, But how do you top the perimeter? I mean, you know, the totality of something like that is just mind-boggling. <clears throat> From after the first run, we ditched the RV because... You know, it was hard to recruit drivers. The gas cost was astronomical. And then I did the last three legs solo, underfunded. I, I didn't have any monetary sponsors. And I just relied on selling books and shirt T-shirts and, and the community. I couch surfed. And it was so amazing. And people always ask, well, how do you describe your run? And, and the word that comes to mind is beautiful, but not beautiful, meaning the scenery but beautiful, that display of humanity from people. And the more I ran, the more I found out how much more right there is with our world than I ever imagined. Could you expand on that a bit more? People came out and helped. They opened their homes to me. I was really, I'm just a stranger running by their town or running through their town. And they wanted to help. They wanted to help me get to the finish. Even though I ran on foot alone, when I crossed that finish line, I brought everybody with me. You did, and inspired people all over America, and now inspiring people on the Tough Girl podcast. I know, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to connect with you on Twitter, what is your Twitter handle? It's one on the run, O-N-E spelled out, one on the run. Fantastic, and you, you mentioned your Facebook page as well. Do you, what's, your, what's your Facebook page? One on the run. Oh, awesome. So you make it super easy. What I'll do is I'll make sure I'll put all of this information in the show notes, which will be available on toughgirlchallenges.com on the blog. And there will be links to her, to Helene's Twitter account, to Helene's Facebook page. And I'll also put the, is there a link as well for Project 150 where people can sponsor you? I, yes, there is. And I can send that to you. Fantastic. We'll put that on there as well. Helene, absolutely staggering what you've done running around the perimeter of the continental United States to inspire health and unity. And I think you've done that. I know you've got um, your book as well, Nurses in Shape. I, I'm assuming you don't have to be a nurse to read the book or, or is it aimed specifically at nurses? No, it's for everyone. And actually, I, I have four books already out. I write a book each leg or I wrote a book each leg of the run. And it's really about all the wonderful people I met. And it, it may become a movie in a couple of years. Fantastic. Watch this space. <laughs> it, would make, it would make a great movie. Helene, thank you so much for being on the Tough Girl podcast. It's been absolutely amazing hearing about your story and all of the different challenges and the good that you're doing in the world in terms of motivating and inspiring other people to think about their health and to think about what they could do next. You've obviously faced huge personal challenges yourself but you've never given up and I think that's a really key message to to give out to all our listeners so no matter what is happening in your life you can keep moving forward and you can take positive action so Helene thank you so much for being on the podcast it's been thank great talking to you today good luck to you and your run thank you I hope you enjoyed that episode. What an incredible achievement running around the whole perimeter of the continental United States. 
Wow. And if you love your running, um, go back and listen to previous episodes of the Tough Girl podcast. We've got some incredible women runners who've done some amazing feats. Amy Hughes ran 53 marathons in 53 days. Emma Timmis, who ran across Africa. Elizabeth Barnes, the MDS winner of 2015. We've got Mimi Anderson, who's just this phenomenal runner and world record holder, Susie Chan, Ali Young, Ari Beresford Webb, who, if you remember, ran around the perimeter of Wales. So loads and loads of inspirational ladies on the Tough Girl podcast. So do go back out and check um, previous episodes out. I'm sure you'll absolutely enjoy them. I don't know about you, but if I'm going out for a long run, then listening to podcasts on the run is just an absolute godsend. It really helps me to maintain my pace listening to stories or listening to interviews just helps to sort of distract you and to take your mind off things, especially for those really, really long distances. So if you normally run listening to music, then give it a change and try and listen to a podcast while you run and just see how, see if you like it or not. It's always worthwhile trying out different things to see if it helps to improve your, your tempo or your speed. Um, just to mention as well is I'm always looking for feedback on the Tough Girl podcast. If you like what I'm doing, then please let me know if there's something you want me to change, if um, if you've got any feedback about my questioning or my interview style, or if you want to, me to ask more specific questions, then please do let me know. I would love to get your feedback, so please send me an email, sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com. You can also reach out to me on Facebook and Twitter. My Twitter handle is at underscore tough underscore girl, all in capitals, and I would just love to hear from you. Have a fantastic week. Don't forget to subscribe and you won't miss out on any future episodes of the Tough Girl podcast. They come out every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time and they are well worth listening to. If you'd enjoyed this episode, then all I ask you to do is to tell a friend about it and share the Tough Girl podcast with them. Hope all of your training is going well and I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.